Last week, we discussed the value of interdisciplinary learning from an institutional perspective. Now, today, we explore this matter further, but more from the perspective of how students can stand to gain from it, right up to the point of career and employment outcomes. And our guest is very involved in student outreach and has rich insights from his engagement with them. We speak now with Associate Professor Loy Hui Chie, who is Vice Dean of External Relations and Student Life with the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the National University of Singapore. Professor, thanks very much for joining us. Tell us, what's your experience with interdisciplinarity, either in research or teaching? Hi, good morning. Yeah, so my own PhD was in philosophy, and most of my research has been on early Chinese philosophy. But all these years, interest and curiosity about other areas have never quite diminished, whether it's ancient Greek philosophy, history of science and technology, or even just contemporary political ideas. Uh, Many of these areas of interest require me to think concurrently from different disciplinary perspectives and to bring together what we sometimes might call Eastern and Western point of view. And sometimes even the input of a social science research is needed as well. For education, I've been teaching at the University Scholars Program um, for over a decade by now. So this is one of NUS's uh, flagship interdisciplinary programs. And more recently, I led the creation of the Philosophy, Politics and Economics or PPE program. And of course, uh, going into the new semester, I'm actually leading the creation of the Integrated Humanities module uh, for the new college. So yeah, I've been either directly involved with or at least on the margins of various interdisciplinary efforts in NUS, even before the formation of the College of Humanities and Sciences. Mm. By the way, my experience is not unique. Uh, it's really just a reminder that what we're trying to achieve with the college builds upon existing experience and expertise among many colleagues. All right. So how is the College of Humanities and Sciences in particular implementing this sort of uh, interdisciplinary curriculum? Yeah, thanks for that question. So I, let me highlight three different things, right? So... The first of all, the first thing is really that we are giving all of the students in the college a robust common curriculum that will include a suite of uh, 21st century skills. These are transferable skills. Uh, you know, they come from different disciplines, but they can be used in a wide variety of settings. You know, artificial intelligence, computational thinking, design thinking, and of course the more familiar scientific inquiry, humanities, Asian studies, social science, and so on. But apart from the transferable skills, the common curriculum will also give students a chance to wade into specific issues from an interdisciplinary perspective, probably through team-taught classes, though we're still planning some of these things. All right, so that's, that's the first one, common curriculum. Then the second one is uh, we want to give our students a highly flexible curriculum structure, right, a structure which facilitates double majors, major minors, even from very contrasting disciplines. For instance, imagine a student who wants to do chemistry and English. Right Now, our existing structure can already allow this but with more inconveniences. So the new structure makes such combinations easy. Right? At the same time, this same flexibility also means that students who want to become deep specialists can also do so, perhaps even to a higher degree than under the existing structure. Right? So thanks to the common curriculum, the point is that even the deep specialists have been armed with the basic skills to go beyond their own disciplines and to work with ideas and peoples from other uh, disciplines. So that's the second thing, that freedom and flexibility. And the third one is, I think, just as important, and I think we often forget about it, right? by bringing together two very large faculties of contrasting offerings, it also means that we're giving students a greater chance to interact with other students from other backgrounds, taking classes together with them. Right? These informal interactions also open up other interdisciplinary possibilities that cannot be underestimated because much of learning is really a social phenomenon. So, I, so three things, right? So the common curriculum, that flexibility, and thirdly, just that scale of interaction that it enables. So, Professor Loy, would that mean also that given that this is uh, made available to students uh, to, to, you know, um, uh, make those uh, decisions as to what they like to take up, would it necessarily mean that it might even lengthen the time at university? Oh, no, no, no. This is still a four-year structure. Okay. <laughs> Everything is nicely planned right. so that it can be, it can be fitted into a four-year structure. Nice. Yeah. Mm. Uh, does that mean that any combination would be possible? In principle, obviously not every combination is e- uh, just as easy to do. A lot would depend on the students themselves, right? But you see, think about it, right? We have divided the page in a particular way, and we have all these choices out there. You can fill them, you know, you can slot them into these different slots on the page, right? But whether or not you think that it's worth doing or it's easy or, it's, you know, you know it, will, it will be convenient or not, that will depend on the students themselves. Some people have certain interests, and others really want to pursue just one thing very deeply, and we want to make sure that they're all supported.
All right, and I'm sure there would be advice from you know um, your office and uh, other academics who might make recommendations and suggestions once they look at what their proposed uh, uh, curriculum or subjects and, and minors and majors uh, the students have expressed interest in. Absolutely, and uh, in a sense, uh, the students themselves are very active, and I don't just mean the, the you know incoming students. Their seniors have always been uh, very actively creating. Uh, mentorship programs, informal mentoring. So all these are always ongoing, actually. And I think that knowledge about what works with what will just continue to be built up over time. Um, many of our students are actually involved in mentoring their juniors as well. So even apart from my office or you know other offices like mine, there's a lot of this sort of uh, you know informal. Uh, consultation going on as well. Yeah. I think what would be important would be to know what the benefits uh, that such interdisciplinary learning would bring students. What are some of them? Yeah, so I need to go back to first principles a little bit, right? So we are doing all this because we believe that we are better preparing our students for the world we already live in. So once upon a time when I do this off, when I give outreach talks, we will talk about you know, the world of the future, the workplace of the future. But actually, that world has arrived, mm. right? So this is a world that is very, very technology-driven, which means that even our English majors can expect the world with applications and data uh, you know, going into the future. And the sci- data scientists, too, will need to persuade people and think about the human implications of, uh, of her work, right? So that's one thing. It's a very technology-driven world. It's kind of everywhere but the human implications are probably the most important part of it, right? Now, this is also a world in which industries themselves aren't as siloed as before. So if you want to just give one example that's quite close to home, like Grab, what kind of a company is that? It's not a transport company, well, it is, I guess, but it's also a technology company, a fintech company, and of course, Grab deals with people, not just machines, Mm -hmm. right? right, So this, but the ability to integrate ideas and people from different disciplines isn't just a workplace need, Individual graduates also need to be able to learn new things as they progress through life. So gone are the days when people do the same thing in the same job for 30 years. So we believe that we are better preparing our graduates to continue their learning through life. So that's the second thing, right? So we want to give them the kind of a common foundation that allows them to learn the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. That may not be strongly tied to the first thing they learn when, you know, in their disciplines here, right? And then I think finally, this is something that I care very much about. Perhaps it's the most important point. It's really not just about making our graduates employment ready or lifelong learners. So obviously, these are very important things. We want them to become contributing citizens, change makers, and thought leaders in a complex world uh, whose problems and opportunities don't respect disciplinary boundaries. So we want to prepare them for that as well. And we believe that the new curriculum structure puts them in a good position for these outcomes. Do you think there are downsides to interdisciplinary learning? Um, is there a risk that interdisciplinary research can lack coherence and maybe a sense of purpose, or maybe there could be a difficulty establishing lines of connection between multiple disciplines? Um, in a manner of speaking, yes, but it doesn't have to go that way. Now you see why we wanted that flexibility, and that was the second thing I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, how we arrange the structure. So it's not just about allowing or making people do this, but it's about making sure that uh, different people are pursuing different parts of it, right? So um, there's a lot of freedom, so students can craft their own journey. We don't really expect all students to make interdisciplinary learning the main focus of their degree. Some people really will do that. They will bring together two disciplines, integrate them, and some will do one discipline plus a bunch of different minors. Um, but some will become these specialists, and we need those too, right? They, you know, they they will be, you know, the PhDs of the future and the the, 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 the deep researchers uh, of the future, right? Now, in all these cases, we want to make sure that they have the chance to enhance their education, and the common curriculum ensures that everyone has enough of their interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary foundation. What they're going to do will depend on each student's attitude and ambitions. Yeah. So I don't think that uh, the, the dangers you're talking about need to exist because they, they really exist when people are not pursuing the thing that they're good at, right? So some people are going to be good at the deep disciplines. They should go there. And there are others who are better at doing a range of things, and they should do that instead. We're hearing from Associate Professor mm-hmm. Loy Hui Che, who is Vice Dean of External Relations and Student Life with the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences over at the National University of Singapore or NUS. Now, Professor Loy, some students might be worried that, you know, coming from the science stream, they may have trouble coping with maybe arts or humanities related subjects or maybe vice versa as well. What reassurance can you give them? Well, the first thing you want to know is that historically, 
uh, something like half of the students who come to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, so this is even before the College of Humanities and Sciences, uh, half the students that come to Humanities and Sciences are in fact from the, art, from the science streams. So just to reassure everyone that mm. in fact this has always been the case, right? Mm. Now, I, I want to say that uh, neither the students coming from the sciences nor the students coming from the arts should unduly worry. The common curriculum classes are only a fraction of the overall curriculum, and we are designing them not to assume any special background. Uh, incidentally, I'm one of the lead designers for the Integrated Humanities module, and my mission is exactly to make it uh, you know, accessible, useful, and hopefully interesting to all students, whether or not they are bound for a humanities major. Incidentally, this isn't something new to NUS. One of the classes I've been teaching for the past decade uh, in the scholars program is basically a humanities-related seminar where the majority of students are from engineering or computing. And they do fine, okay? And I also have uh, experience running a very large introductory philosophy module, um, you know, where the vast majority of students are not from philosophy, nor will they be majoring in philosophy. And again, they do fine, right? Making sure that students have enough of a level playing field is something that we are quite mindful of. My only request to the students, if anyone, anyone is hearing this, is come to the college with an open mind. After all, to join us is to seek a university education, not just you know, vocational training. You're basically putting out your hand to say that you desire that exposure to the life of the mind right? that, that makes up a university education. Obviously, we aren't we are, we are expecting you know, students to be already masters of things that we are going to teach you. But we do need everyone to be ready to learn, ready to explore new frontiers. And guess what? The university is a great place to do that. Now, Professor Loy, I understand that some Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences graduates have gone on to some pretty interesting jobs, and, <laughs> and this is after they underwent uh, interdisciplinary learning. So tell us more about these students. Um, okay, so since we're talking about graduates from before the time of a College of Humanities and Sciences, so we probably shouldn't oversell the idea that they have a lot of interdisciplinary training when they were here, because we, this is, in many ways, some of these things are new to us as well, right? But we do have a lot of graduates who are doing very interesting things. Things that you might say are kind of interdisciplinary, even if they didn't study it here, but that's what they're doing now, right? So we have a, you know, a philosophy graduate who is a tech entrepreneur, co-founder of a technology startup. Um, you know, her name is Chi Ru. So we have another one, I'm going to talk about the two philosophy graduates first because I'm from, from you know, this format department. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, yeah, you know, and in both cases, they were actually my ex-students. So Chris, uh, he's a filmmaker. He's actually one of the recent Golden Horse Award recipients. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Yoshi Hua, right? So he's also a philosophy graduate. I was at a filming, a film screening with him. It's funny, it, it was his movie and somewhere in the middle of it, he turned to me and said, Paul Floyd, do you see the private joke? I said, yes, I saw it. <laughs> 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 it was a little moment that he was kind of referencing something that you know, we talked about in class many mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Elliot Tan, English graduate, YouTube star, right, in Tree Potato. Uh, Chilin, a history graduate, uh, who went on to work in communications, and now he's a data scientist in a quality assurance company. Uh, Alicia, uh, no, sorry, not Alicia, Alaric Ku, uh, Chu, sociology graduate, co-founded the gaming chair company Secret Lab. I'm not sure whether you heard of this. Oh, but yeah. They are, yes, yeah, they are famous for wow. their ergonomic chairs. Mm -hmm. right? um, Ji Ronghui, economics graduate, now working as a data scientist, I believe, in a skills future Singapore. And I'm sure there are many others. Now, here's the interesting thing about them. Many of them actually studied, I mean, these are all people who study in faculty of arts and social sciences. And, um, some of them did some kind of interdisciplinary thing, but not all of them did while they are in school here. However, they remind me that interdisciplinarity isn't always just about integrating subject matters and disciplines in the classroom. I think just as importantly, perhaps even more importantly, it's also about a certain underlying mindset, right? A readiness to see and make connections with people and ideas wherever you are so that you can add value to the world. And of course, this means that there is a kind of readiness to learn new things. Each of the alumni mentioned is passionate about what they studied. I had to you know whenever I chat with uh, some of these philosophy graduates, for instance, you know, you know, we ask them, so do you regret studying what you studied? They say, no, of course not, Prof. Roy. We totally love what we studied, <laughs> right? But the important thing is that they never felt confined or stuck with what they studied. Rather, they used their university education as a starting point to continue learning, to make connections with other things that they haven't learned before, to, to, you know, and to bring these insights from different uh, backgrounds together to do their things. And that's what I appreciate about all these graduates. 
Yeah, definitely no pigeonholing. Uh, mm-hmm. Just hearing you out and how you know they may have studied certain field, but then they went on to do a totally different uh, kind of work and 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 you know tapping on different skill sets as well. So very exciting uh, those graduate examples that you had mentioned. Now, a university education is definitely not just about hitting the books, but give us some little known facts about student life on <laughs> campus as well. We know that you know living on campus sometimes can be really exciting and enriching as well. Some of these enriching activities that are also offered on campus at NUS. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of student life going on in the U.S., even though we have to deal with the fact that COVID does put a damper on a lot of things. But students yeah. are adjusting as well, right? Mm-hmm. So one thing I can say is that um, the faculty is host to some at least 20, something like 20 different student society in a club serving the interests of the different majors and over and above a main faculty or student club. So they all organize events, camps, seminars, talks all the time. And I believe... You know, it's no different over in the Faculty of Science as well. Now, since I'm actually a residential fellow who stays in the, one of the colleges here, I can also speak a little bit about that. So students here are very active in pursuing their own interests. They do their own coding projects, you know, uh, get together and do their own hackathons. They teach each other languages. They dance and sing. They bake. They make gourmet coffee for the community, <laughs> right? Uh, there's even a group that over, many, over the course of many years, creators community service where they pass in students from underprivileged families to give them private tuition. So many of these activities take place on the students' own initiative rather than because we tell them to do this or that. But if anything, sometimes as faculty members, we find ourselves telling them to please pace yourselves and not overcommit. Yeah, right? So right. I actually think that uh, a lot of it is really just up to the students themselves. We can provide some resources, but ultimately the students themselves have to be the real drivers. Uh, there are many, many different groups in NUS, so it's almost certain that you know if a young person comes here and has a particular interest, it's very likely that that interest is represented somewhere. And mm-hmm. if it's not, my advice would be get your friends together and start something. We want that to happen too. <laughs> <laughs> just hearing you out describing yeah. student life and also interdisciplinary learning just gives me one word and it probably is vibrant. That's how vibrant it can be uh, both for the causes that are available and also the life that can be led over on NUS campus. Associate Professor Loy, thank you so much for your time. We enjoy and appreciate uh, your, your speaking with us. Associate Professor Loy Hui Chia is Vice Dean of External Relations and Student Life with the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences over at the National University of Singapore, NUS. And you can find out more about the NUS College of Humanities and Sciences at this website. It's at chs.nus.com nus.edu.sg Career Compass in partnership with the National University of Singapore.